Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, again, my name is Lindsay Ogle, and I'm a doctoral candidate in performance studies, and I'm also the director of the Berkeley Graduate, which is an online journal as part of the Graduate Assembly. As a curator researching the role of socially engaged art and media in bridging the political divide, I am very excited to welcome our first panel today, uh, who are going to provide a framework for our conversation by charting the complexities and goals of the free speech debate. Our panelists will each begin by offering some opening remarks, and then we'll open up the conversation for discussion and for questions from you all. Um, let me begin briefly by introducing our panelists. Jeffrey Nunberg is an adjunct full professor at the School of Information. Until 2001, he was a principal scientist at the Xerox Palo Alto Research working on the development of linguistic technologies. Nunberg has written scholarly books and articles on a range of topics, including semantics and pragmatics, information access, written language structure, multilingualism and language policy, and the cultural implications of digital technologies. He's written on language and other topics for The Atlantic, The Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, and The Sunday New York Times, among others. He does regular language commentary on the NPR program Fresh Air, and has been the subject of features in Fortune, the Harvard Business Review, the Boston Globe, among others. He's also a, cur a contributor to the blog, Language Log. His 2000 book, Talking Right, How Conservatives Turn Liberalism into a, let me get this right, tax-raising, latte-drinking, sushi-eating, Volvo-driving, New York Times-reading, body-piercing, Hollywood-loving, left-wing freak show, was named one of the 10 books of the year by the Washington Monthly. His 2009 book, The Years of Talking Dangerously, was selected as a notable book of the year by the San Francisco Chronicle. And for his general, ring, ling, excuse me, general writing about language, Nunberg was awarded the Linguistic Society of America's Language and Public Interest Award in 2001. His most recent book, Ascent of the A-Word, Assholeism, The First 60 Years, was released in 2012 by Public Affairs. Manu Meal is studying political science and economics at UC Berkeley. In light of the 2016 election, he has been working to bridge the political divide and ex that exists in our nation. He's passionate about facilitating constructive dialogue between opposing political perspectives, and he helped create Bridge USA at Berkeley in an effort to bridge the political divide. Manu is the external affairs VP of Bridge USA and leads efforts to create bridge chapters across the country. Nicole Rennell is an educator and PhD co candidate at, in the Social and Cultural Studies of Education program at UC Berkeley. Her research explores how academic freedom is valued and practiced at two public Ivy League schools and aims to elucidate the ways of reinforcing the academy's connection to and responsibility for the public that it is tasked to serve. Bill Shireman is a lecturer at the Haas School of Business. As the president and CEO of Fortune 500, Bill, Bill helps the world's largest companies and most impassioned activists find common ground. Breaking through the traditional left-right divide, Sherman, Shireman's books and studies prove that we can protect the earth, promote freedom, and increase prosperity at the same time. Shireman united Coors, Safeway, and the Sierra Club to design and pass California's bottle bill recycling law the lowest cost and most effective in the nation. He united Mitsubishi and Rainforest Action Network to work together to save rainforests in North America to Malaysia. He brought together Coca-Cola and the Genocide Intervention, Intervention Network to help promote peace in the Sudan. Now he is helping unite activists and skeptic interests in, clim in the climate sphere. Sherman's most recent book, What We Learned in the Rainforest, Business Lessons from Nature, featured in the Harvest Business, Business Review, which declares the business as machine era over and shows how companies can grow to become as innovative as the rainforest, leveraging feedback to grow more profitable and sustainable than ever. Claudio von Vacano is the executive director of D-Lab and, and the Digital Humanities at Berkeley and is on the board of the Social Science Matrix. The D-Lab helps Berkeley faculty and staff and graduate students move forward with world-class re research in data-intensive social science. She has worked in policy and educational administration for 17 years, 
and at the UC Office of the President and UC Berkeley for the last 10 years. Claudia received a master's degree from Stanford University in learning, design, and technology. Her doctoral work is in policy, organizations, measurement, and evaluation from UC Berkeley. Her expertise is in organizational theory and behavior, and in education and language policy and implementation. She has been honored by the Phi Beta Kappa Society, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, and the Thomas J. Watson Foundation, among others, for her scholarly work and service contributions. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thanks for that introduction, and I think on behalf of all of us. Um, uh, I want to talk about a, a couple of related notions free speech, free inquiry, or rational discourse, or, or, or what you will, and um, the challenges of the new media. The, in fact, most of the themes I'll be uh, uh, touching on today were already, between Nicholas and, and uh, Chancellor Christ and, and Robert Reich, have already been touched on. So think of this as this footnotes. Or, um, so we think of these issues of free speech as these antique questions. They go back to, to Milton, or maybe to the Enlightenment, or at least to Holmes and, 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 and Brandeis and, and, and so on. And the, 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 you think of there being a, a, a continuous line of discussion and deliberation over these questions. Um, but they clearly play out in a particular social and technological contexts. Uh, which colors the way we think about them. And I, I think it, it's, it, it can be easy to lose sight of that. Um, by way of example, uh, back in 2000, uh, actually 2001, I was um, uh, an expert witness on behalf of the American Library Association, which together with the uh, ACLU uh, had brought a, a challenge to the Children's Internet Protection Act, uh, which mandated that pornography software filters had to be installed in all the libraries that received certain subsidies under the Telecommunications Act of, of 1996. Um, <clears throat> I had worked in text classification technologies and, and, and so on, so I was asked to be an, an expert witness. And we showed uh, that the filters that people wanted to install couldn't get even a large portion of the porn on the web without blocking enormous numbers of useful sites, uh, sex, sex information sites, uh, um, <coughs> gay and lesbian sites, health sites, and just random stuff, a site about obituaries, whatever. Um, so the, the, uh, a panel of the, uh, of the Third Circuit uh, uh, ruled with us and said that the law was, uh, was unconstitutional, but it went back to the, went up to the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, <coughs> where, one issue that uh, was, uh, was crucial was this question of what to do about these blocked sites. And the law had made provision, well, if you, if you want to look at a site that's been blocked, you can raise your hand uh, and ask the librarian to unblock it for you uh, so that that should be OK. And um, uh, <coughs> uh, the um, uh, attorney who was um, uh, representing the American Library Association said, well, look, this is a little onerous, you're asking a 15-year-old girl to say, excuse me, I want to see this site about sexually transmitted diseases. Is that, is that OK? But the court um, tended to look on this and on the internet in general as just a kind of extension of the library. Uh, the um, um, uh, uh, the um, uh, Solicitor General, who was Ted Olson at the time, said, well, libraries are just asking uh, declining to put on their computer screens the same content they've traditionally excluded uh, from their bookshelves. And um, uh, Justice Breyer, who was in the, uh, on the sort of liberal half of the court, said, uh, what's the burden in asking students to, to raise their hand and so on? I grew up in a world where certain materials were kept in a special place. Um, so, uh, and they, they, found that they found the law constitutional, overruled the, uh, the Third Circuit. Um, now, in retrospect, I think it's quite clear that the court got this really, really wrong, uh, that when you um, move from the library to the internet, you're not just moving to a larger kind of library. I think the Supreme Court justices, who were not very internet savvy, thought of the internet as just a kind of elaborated nexus or lexus, you know. Um, <coughs> um, 
but it becomes a, 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 an open forum where everybody has the right to speak and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and listen, much more like the speaker's corner at, at, at Hyde Park. And what might be a reasonable restriction on free speech uh, at the, uh, in the traditional library wasn't reasonable in, on, on the web. I'm just going to put my stopwatch on so I don't. Um, <coughs> and this points to a more general point. Once you uh, get on the internet, you can't look at traditional institutions like the library, the university, the media, and so on and so forth to do the kind of filtering and selection that they've done traditionally in, in, in a print culture. Um, and to select certain information as, as valuable or important and marginalize, uh, marginalize the rest. So why does this matter to these questions about free speech and, and free inquiry? Um, well, there's a kind of syllogism uh, in the arguments about, uh, about free speech, um, and particularly as it regards the university. The function of the university, I think we all believe, uh, is to foster what John Dewey called free inquiry. You could call it uh, any number of other things, uh, rational discourse, <coughs> and, and ensure the conditions to make that, that possible. That's the first part of the syllogism. Um, second, the assumption is that free inquiry depends on ensuring freedom of speech, uh, that constraints on free speech are somehow constraints on free inquiry, even really bad speech, even really offensive speech. Uh, uh, John Stuart Mill said, well, you know, bad speech you, you should allow because there may be a kernel of truth in it and it does express ideas and at the very least it challenges you to justify your positions and maybe makes you a little less complacent and, and, and so on. And the assumption goes on to, uh, to, 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 to say that um, um, <clears throat> if you subject bad ideas to free inquiry, uh, that's the way to discredit them. And that, that goes back to, 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 to Milton, let truth and falsehood grapple whoever knew truth to, to be put to the worst. Uh, <clears throat> and that's what underlies the, uh, the argument for tolerance. Um, uh, this is Jonathan Rouse. Uh, painful though hate speech may be for individual members of minorities or other targeted groups, its toleration is to their great collective benefit because in a climate of free intellectual exchange, hateful and bigoted ideas are refuted and discredited. And again, this is the kind of argument that comes with a system disk, so to speak. It's, 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 it's very familiar. Um, there's a little step missing here uh, in, in that argument, though. Uh, when we talk about a climate of free intellectual exchange or talk about listening to and engaging with somebody's views and, and, and so on, um, you're presuming, uh, you're presupposing a certain kind of forum. You think of, you know, Norman Rockwell's famous painting of the New England town meeting, which he produced to illustrate Roosevelt's principle of, of, of free speech, freedom of speech, or you know, just a a, a, a panel at the uh, uh, American Enterprise Institute, whatever. You, that, that's the kind of forum you think of. Um, but what's left unsaid is that most of the bad speech in the world. A bad speech, I mean racist speech, offensive speech, but also just bad speech, uh, is, uh, is, has never been offered in, in, in the spirit of, of, of free inquiry. People are not arguing in good faith. They're not listening generously. Eloquent listening was, was uh, Robert Wright's phrase. I like that very much. Um, they're not conforming to rules of argumentation and evidence that we assume are going to be in play, at least in the ideal case, in, in, in to, to make free, in, free inquiry possible. Um, most of that speech lives its life in the private sphere between intimates. Um, <coughs> I think of the case at uh, Oklahoma University a couple of years ago. You'll all remember those fraternity boys were, the fraternity students were um, uh, on a bus uh, on a way to a party or something like that, and somebody videoed them uh, singing, uh, 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 there will never be an N-word in SAE, you can hang him from a tree, but he won't, whatever. Uh, and and it, came up on YouTube and there was a huge fuss about it and, and the, two of the students were expelled in fact. Um, I'm not sure. Um, if that was uh, if that was legally justified, I mean what they what they were doing would have been wouldn't have counted as hate speech even by the most widest definition of that. I mean they weren't aiming the speech at anybody else. They weren't trying to uh, intimidate anybody else, it was between them, uh, and so on and so forth. 
Now, this, this kind of speech is, this is where most of this speech goes on, uh, how it traditionally goes on. Um, and it's not the kind of speech, it's not really visible in, 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 in the, in the or hasn't really been visible in, in, the, in, the, in the public world. And it's not the kind of speech that the people who talk about free speech and free inquiry are concerned with. Yeah, it's, it's deplorable and we wish people weren't do, wouldn't do this. Um, uh, but, it, but it isn't within the scope of the, the speech acts that people have in mind when they talk about defending free speech. That, that isn't it. Um, so let me come back to technology now, um, because this, this, is, this has really uh, changed in, 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 the, in the modern world. Um, you think of the world in which the free speech movement originally took form, uh, the, the informational order of that world. And there will be speakers, I think, at noon talking about that, uh, that, that, that movement. Um, but it was a world where the informational environment was very restricted and concentrated. A few companies owned a large number of the newspapers. There were three networks. Uh, the um, uh, radio was, uh, was constrained by the uh, equal time rule. <coughs> um, and the free speech people, um, free speech movement people, wanted to break that lock on public discourse. Uh, and they had at their disposal only a few puny technologies. Uh, they had mimeograph machines, they had electric uh, 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 loudspeakers, uh, megaphones, uh, photo offset, all of these, by the way, fairly recent inventions at that point. Um, and they had to use those puny technologies um, to be able to, uh, <coughs> uh, to, to secure the right to organize face-to-face -to, -face to uh, to hold public meetings in, 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 in Sproul Plaza and so on and so forth in the face of a university that wanted to repress uh, uh, any kind of, of, of political organizing uh, on campus. Um, their object wasn't to displace the university or undermine the university. They rather wanted to change um, the nature of the, of, of the, of, of the discourse uh, in, in public life. And they succeeded along with the civil rights groups and so on and so forth in doing that, not just the free speech movement people, but the, the left of the 60s managed to move the public discourse uh, impressively. But it, but it was a question of moving that centered discourse. Um, so that, I think, is the world that's, that's evoked when people talk about free speech uh, in the university. It's a bit like the court on filtering. We're still back in the age of the, of, 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 uh, of the, of the library. Um, by the time Milo ascends the steps of uh, Sproul Hall, you're in a completely different world. And, and people have already spoken about this this morning. I'll kind of skip over it. But um, uh, there's a surfeit of information. Um, the, um, uh, but Paul Duguid uh, and, and John Seeley Brown uh, list the effects of the internet as uh, demassification, disintermediation, disaggregation, decentralization, denationalization, despatialization, dematerialization, basically meaning things fall apart. Uh, <clears throat> one consequence of this, uh, in addition to all the valuable speech that's now accessible, uh, is that there's an enormous amount of informational pollution. Uh, there's content that's violent, offensive, trivial, misleading, deceptive, fraudulent, uh, untrustworthy, uh, uh, racist, and, 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 and so on. Paul, Paul Dugan and I in a, in a, in a, call this um, rotten information. Um, the center and the periphery are no longer distinct. Things that used to be consigned to the margins of discourse now bubble up into the center. There's a, a letter called the Franklin Prophecy that made the rounds in the 1930s. It's a bogus letter said to have been written by Benjamin Franklin uh, at the time of the uh, Constitutional Convention saying, oh, you can't let the Jews settle in America because they'll undermine the, the, the nation. So it was a complete fraud, complete phony. The language wasn't contemporary and so on and so forth. And it disappeared sometime around the, night, the late 30s. And all of a sudden, the internet comes, and now it's all, all, all over the place on the internet, having <coughs> no longer been consigned to the margins, but there are no margins uh, uh, on the internet. Um, you get uh, uh, this effacing of the boundary between public and private, uh, so that people enact what used to be private thoughts and behavior in, in, in a public and, and, and visible way. And it surfaces the kind of transgressive behavior uh, that used to be closeted, like the Oklahoma University students. Um, um, uh, as Clay Shirky said, I like the way he put this, the internet means we can now see what other people really think. This has been a huge disappointment. 
Um, <laughs> so you get this cacophony of voices. Uh, individually, they're of limited range, but they can congeal uh, into these, uh, very, this very potent force. You get the phenomenon of collective trolling that, that, uh, that uh, Bob Reich was talking about. Um, a woman writes something critical of uh, the sexism in, in the video game uh, industry, and all of a sudden there are 15,000 adolescent boys sitting in their bedrooms typing anonymous rape threats with one hand. You know, um, uh, it reemerges in the physical world. Um, Barb Rice was talking about crowdsourcing violence, or actually crowdsourcing crowds. Uh, um, um, Charlottesville is, 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 is as much an internet, an internet phenomenon as, as 4chan. Um, and and it, it, emerged, it, it invades the academy, um, both in terms of the, 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 the power of these people to, um, <coughs> to troll people in the academy and to spread this, this kind of speech in the academy, and in the case of Milo, for example, um, to um, <coughs> To physically uh, come to the to the academy and 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 do this this routine he does, which is not for the benefit. He's not like Mario Savio trying to win hearts and minds. He's got his back turned, as it were, to the university, and is really hoping for a reaction that will uh, be to the delectation of his of his clack. Um, so um, this is a problem for the right. Uh, um, Serious conservatives have been troubled over this. Uh, David Brooks has talked about the way in which uh, uh, the right has uh, worked through perpetual hysteria and simple-minded polemics. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, writing about the Ben Shapiro uh, appearance, said, well, Carol, uh, Carol Chris did a good job, and we hope they'll do an equally good job uh, with, with Milo. Though they said, uh, 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 we, we wish Berkeley students were hearing from conservatives who seek to persuade more than merely provoke, like the Milo gang. That's the Wall Street Journal. Whose fault is it that it was Milo and not any of the num numerous serious conservatives they might have been? Well, in this case, the, the Berkeley Republicans and this, this um, uh, the Berkeley Patriot group, um, who, who acted, I think, in bad faith uh, in, in, inviting, uh, in inviting Milo because <clears throat> Uh, that kind of speech doesn't support the enterprise of free inquiry. It, it, it subverts it. Um, on the other hand, is there bad faith on the part of the, the campus left? Well, I don't know if you talk about bad faith. There is a problem uh, with, with this notion of elephant listening, a failure of generosity. Um, because it's, it's very difficult to distinguish now the kinds of speech that need to be resisted that can't really be addressed uh, uh, as it, in, in the spirit of free inquiry. When Milo gets up and to give a talk and says uh, uh, feminism is cancer and then just sits down, you don't, you don't have that conversation. It doesn't make any sense to swear. You can't out-troll the troll. Um, <coughs> so I think uh, the, the object here is that students um, have to, and, and, and members of the community, uh, have to learn uh, to, to make this distinction between uh, the kind of language that has to be resisted and the kind of language that has to be, has to be engaged. It's not easy. Uh, if it were easy, it wouldn't be necessary. I, I once said, when, after one of these racial in incidents, people were calling for a national conversation about race, as they always do. And I was saying, well, if you really could have a national conversation about race, you wouldn't have to. Um, but I think it's a goal uh, that's, that's more <coughs> urgent now uh, than ever before. So let me start. Uh, so it's, you know, I'm probably the least uh, qualified candidate on this panel, which makes it more natural that I'm going to keep my remarks to a, to a short uh, and brief uh, inclusion point. So essentially, I uh, helped create Bridge USA, which is one of the co-host uh, organizations of this uh, discussion and my uh, three other fellow executive board members have all been, you know, absolutely essential to helping, you know, create this organization. And my basically the way I'll approach this is essentially discuss the purposes of and the 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 reason why you know we need an organization and we need spaces for such sorts of discussions to take place, especially in a university environment and in a larger political scale. And then discuss 
um, how we go about achieving this idea of really trying to get the extremes on both sides to um, you know, essentially congeal and talk about important uh, discussion points. As you know, Robert Reich uh, uh, eloquently mentioned, you know, this idea of listening. How do we incorporate this idea of listening into, uh, you know, student populations across uh, the, uh, the, you know, the country? So essentially, right after the 2016 election, you know, I'm a sophomore, so I'm very involved with student politics and, you know, what's happening within um, student organizations. I noticed that there's a real um, lack of hope and there's a lack of, um, uh, you know, investment in this idea of dialogue as a way or as a mechanism for really fostering change in, you know, both the political sphere and in terms of, you know, their own lives. You know, how do we go about trying to achieve change? And people saw that there was a real disappointment. And, you know, there's a lot of liberal and conservative people who point to this. For example, Van Jones, who constantly says this idea of there's a lack of hope. So Bridge USA, and, you know, there's other organizations across the country, primarily as part of the Bridge Alliance, which one of my co-panelists, Bill Shireman, is a member of, essentially what we're trying to do is bring those extremes together and how do we go about achieving that uh, sort of bridging act. Um, and there's three main ways we go about trying to inculcate the sort of discussion. And I think that it's very important to discuss the idea of you know, how free speech uh, relates to these sorts of discussion. You know, what is our responsibility as people who talk about free speech and what is our responsibility as people who have that right and how do we responsibly engage in that right to really facilitate discussion across different party lines. And what we got, um, from Bridge uh, USA and hosting you know, these student discussions throughout last semester, inviting speakers, um, having events that blow, you know, blew up and then figuring out you know, how do we deal with it, how do we learn from what happened. And the primary thing that we found was that free speech is not an end in and of itself. It's a means by which we achieve some sort of larger goal. So this idea that you know, let's discuss what free speech is or let's talk about is free speech under attack, that's really counterproductive to this I, larger idea that free speech has really been politicized in our national political landscape. There's been use of free speech as a way for people from both sides of the political spectrum to really, you know, say that this is th this is a way that we're going to go about, you know, sparking controversy and pushing our ideologies. And we found that free speech needs to be a way to as uh, we need to discuss free speech in a constructive manner. There needs to be engagement from across the political spectrum in a constructive dialogue. And I'll admit this: Bridge USA last semester, you know, we partook in inviting Ann Coulter, who was one of the you know, big syndic columnists. We received a lot of criticism for that. And we learned from that, and as Robert Reich alluded to this, that if you have the right of free speech, you have to act responsibly with that right. You know? And we have to be very uh, caring in how we uh, talk about discussions of free speech and whether or not we're constructive. Because at the end of the day, discussions about free speech, discussions about politics are absolutely useless unless they're tied to a further goal of you know, reaching some sort of compromise or reaching some sort of political objective. And I think that it's absolutely necessary that we have continued to have discussions like this where we discuss in a productive and constructive manner, and constructive being the key, in figuring out how we galvanize people from both sides, how we challenge our own ideological bubbles, and how do we go about really producing a movement within our country where we unite people from the, not necessarily from the extremes, but the large majority of moderates in the middle who believe that discussion is important and that democratic deliberation is a centerpiece of democracy. And with that, I'll close my remarks because I hope that you know, everyone else gets an opportunity to speak as well. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, I was asked to speak uh, a little bit to the role of free speech um, in the university, how new media is perhaps altering the work of the university, and what uh, our institution can do to adapt to the changes. Um, I prepared some remarks that are short remarks that are informed by my research. As Lindsay said, I'm really interested in academic freedom, how it's valued and practiced on an individual and institutional level at public universities, uh, mainly because I'm very invested in the democratizing potential of the public university. Historically, the academy has functioned as a laboratory for ideological debate contributing to the advancement of knowledge production. The public university has been assigned an additional task of increasing the accessibility of a liberal arts education designed to develop critical thinking and socially responsible citizens to underrepresented populations, particularly low-income communities of color. While it's debatable whether the public university indeed reflects an ethos of democracy or whether it ever has, 
Uh, I think it's crucial that we remember that the university can only advance a more aware, responsible citizenry if intellectuals within it are actively challenging politics of indifference and in violence. The hallmark of the US higher education system, academic freedom, is intended to protect the free speech of intellectuals, students, and scholars um, in their research, in their teaching, and while acting as a private citizen. The, this protection is particularly important for public intellectuals who engage with broad audiences. Today, we're here to discuss how new media has changed the conversation surrounding free speech on college campuses. An aspect of my research looks at how public intellectuals who critique uh, institutionalized and systemic injustice experience exercising their free speech. While the internet allows them to reach larger audiences than ever before, it also has created a set of challenges for these intellectuals and for their audiences. I'm just going to speak to a couple of those. There's this popular narrative that connotes a snowflake with a leftist who is intolerant of conservative ideas. John Wilson, an editor of the American Association of University Professors Academe blog, points out that snowflakes fall everywhere. While the internet increases their visibility, public intellectuals can currently increase their risk of surveillance by the emergence of a sophisticated network of media outlets some of which monitor and even create profiles of radical scholars while encouraging students to file complaints of political bias to these websites. You can imagine that the experiences of public intellectuals vary drastically. One, in, one professor I interviewed experienced no chilling effect by being uh, doxxed on these websites. He happens to be tenured. Another received so many death threats that she genuinely feared for her and her family's lives and has curbed how much she says and what she says and when she says it. Another still has good reason to believe that their difficulty getting hired in academia is a result of the online character assassination that they've experienced through these efforts of suppressing free speech. Doxing, for those who might not be familiar, is an internet-based practice of broadcasting private or identifiable information with the aim of harassing uh, and intimidating. And it can leave a permanent mark on someone's legacy. It's important to note for me here that this doesn't just affect professors, but students as well. Uh, lamentably, many of our own here at Cal. While still underexplored, this phenomena of doxing, at least in my research, is showing signs of threatening the university's mission of challenging the status quo, particularly for intellectuals who are members of vulnerable communities, such as people of color, mothers of small children, folks lacking job security, just to name a few. Uh, this is a theme that I'm sure is going to be woven throughout the day of uh, reifying echo chambers, uh, making it harder for individuals to consider opposing views um, and such with these surveillance websites, public opinion is often shaped by information that isn't, um, that lacks peer review and therefore um, it's difficult to verify its legitimacy. So we were posed the question, how can our institutions ensure that meaningful and purposeful debate continues? It's a big question. Um, I'm going to offer one suggestion for consideration. During this politically polarized moment of history, debates regarding free speech on college campuses tend to revolve around the rights of invited conservative speakers. While I see a benefit in investing to keep people safe, and while I'm sure our administration is overwhelmed with dealing with current lawsuits and consumed by attempting to pre prevent future lawsuits, I hope that special attention is given to the students, lecturers, and professors who have been doxxed and threatened for their critiques of, in, of systemic injustice to see what kind of institutional support that they need 
um, and that could be provided in order to sustain what Berkeley is known for, not just an abstract defense of free speech, but free speech that challenges politics of domination that hinder possibilities for a more inclusive, just society. Thank you. Thank you for everybody for spending your time and your day here discussing what I think is a very vitally important issue at a time in our nation that I think is existentially uh, uh, poses a risk uh, that uh, a few of us uh, can fully comprehend. I decided spontaneously that the title of my brief remarks here, relatively brief, uh, is that the enemy is the algorithm. The enemy is the algorithm. Um, I came to Berkeley as a student some years ago, quite a number, and at that time I was already a, a bit of a political hybrid. I uh, chose to become very active in two communities. One was Ralph Nader and the Pergs. At, the, at that time, the Perg movement, consumer movement, was relatively new, and I became a, uh, a student leader here and then a leader nationally in the, in the, in the Nader movement uh, and in Pergs. Helped to build the fund that is now, uh, uh, now has 25 or 30 different progressive groups that are a part of it. I also uh, was a registered Republican and someone who believed in what I thought were the core principles of being a Republican. That is, that we uh, 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 support limited government, that we champion uh, the liberation of people, the, as historically shown in the, the uh, abolition of slavery, the establishment of the, of the uh, right to vote for women, uh, warnings about the military industrial complex, and, uh, and so on. And that, and, and that I was in business, I liked business, I liked enterprise, I liked the process of trade, I liked capitalism, if you will. Uh, and, uh, and that seemed to make me a Republican. Um, since that time, I have jockeyed among those, and that's why in my vita, uh, there's a lot of work in bringing together corporations and activist groups, corporations theoretically conservative, active groups, activist groups mostly progressive, and more recently bringing together Republicans and Democrats. Uh, conservatives and progressives, uh, because I see them not as enemies, but as complementary opposites, uh, each of them having gaps that the other can fill if they are brought together. And I wanna make three points here. Um, uh, the first one, responding to uh, Secretary Reich's uh, very well articulated remarks. Um, but I would differ with one of those, and that was, uh, that it's about the big money. I think that it is bigger than big money. The argument that this is something, that, this, that, that today's division is the consequence of the imposition of ideas by big money, I think falls into the narratives that define the, the fundamental divide between the left and the right. In my experience, and I was very much engaged. I am not. A, I am hardly a billionaire myself, but I but I have found it uh, 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 possible to engage with folks that are among the biggest contributors to politics, and particularly on the Republican side, politics in the in the country. And I will tell you, it was not big money that resulted in the outcomes of the last election. Big money was supportive of Jeb Bush. Big money was supportive of Marco Rubio. Big money was supportive of Hillary Clinton. Uh, those are the losers, as we'll recall, uh, of that election. Big money uh, was, uh, for the most part, desperate to avoid somebody like uh, uh, Donald Trump, as well as somebody like Bernie Sanders. Uh, and so uh, we need to look deeper at the, at the cause of the dilemma that we're in. Which brings me to my second point, which is that the enemy is the algorithm. But I think it's a much bigger algorithm than the one that we are focused on. It's not just the social media algorithm. When I was growing up, it was in the shadow or aftermath of World War II and the Depression. A couple of generations had passed. This was, you know, I was in school in 
whatever, 1976, and, and, uh, uh, and I grew up in the 60s. But at that time, there was a social algorithm that was driving the kind of culture that we were creating in this country. And it was an algorithm, the code for which was written in World War II uh, and in the aftermath of the Depression. And it was an algorithm that said, in order to survive and, out and overcome the Depression, and in order to beat the fascists, we need to combine the power of the three great institutions that had the capacity together to win those wars. We had to bring government, together with corporations, together with labor. Government to provide the money that we needed through massive deficit spending. Corporations to provide the organization and structure to create a massive uh, uh, increase in our productivity. And labor to provide the people for the relatively interchangeable jobs in offices and factories that needed to support that. We did that because we had a united objective to defeat the enemy that we faced. In the aftermath of that, that power algorithm, if you will, remained and has changed over time, but through no conscious decision of any of, uh, of, any of us, or certainly us as a nation, that basic power structure is still there, evolving and adapting. Government has continued to expand. The federal government has continued to expand enormously as have state governments and others, but the, but the power remains centralized to the federal government. Corporate power has expanded, but it's no longer just steel and auto and a few core industries. There's a wide swath of industries. Uh, the labor union uh, movement has also expanded, although labor unions per se have perhaps declined, uh, they, they have spawned an array of organizations and institutions that take up their mission of social justice. So we have government, which to people represents, people on the left in any case represents uh, democracy. People on the right represents oppression. We have corporations, which to the left represents, represent oppression, and to the right represent freedom and free enterprise. And we have labor, which to the left represents justice, and to the right represents coercion and, uh, and uh, the usurpation of, of control and, uh, and the growth of individualism of a giant mass of, of interchangeable people. So we have these big institutions that are in control. Now, there's no individuals that are really driving this, but these, this is the algorithm that we have inherited. It creates a framework for the development of the internet uh, and our economy today. So how does that, how does that uh, uh, reflect how we deal with the, the issue at hand? I graduated Berkeley with a uh, degree in journalism. And at that time, I realized, looking around at journalism, that journalism, the practice of journalism, was much better than it needed to be to excel uh, and survive in this system. Worked for the San Jose Mercury News, had a big you know, news hole, as they called it, because they had so many advertisements, and they could afford to send us out to do quality journalism. And I knew that we were doing a better job than we had to to satisfy the market. We could, we could drive journalistic standards way down, save a lot of money, return a lot more money to the investors uh, if we just uh, were willing to sacrifice our principles. In the days and years since that time, that's exactly what we've done. We've taken journalism, we've taken the media, and we've sucked out of it the quality and left only the algorithm, which is that we are a profit-making enterprise that maximizes our revenue by selling ads. And we sell ads by uh, identifying where people are going to be, where they're, where they're uh, 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 where their bodies are, but their minds are not. We're going to identify people. We're going to maximize the number of eyeballs that we have watching our ad without brains attached and really functioning. And, uh, and so the media have distilled down uh, to present to us, and this is an oversimplification, but I think the two uh, uh, broad divisions of media now pander to either a left-wing perspective of the world or a right-wing perspective of the world. They take those institutions of World War II, government and labor unions, which tend to be the favorites of the left, 
and corporations and the military establishment, which tend to be the favorites of the right, and they idealize them and demonize the other. They perpetuate a narrative on the left that corporations and wealthy people are out of control and they need to be brought under control by the institutions that we like, government and professional associations, labor unions, and so on. They perpetuate a counter narrative on the right that big government is out of control and big labor is out of control and it needs to be tamed by free enterprise, which we regard as corporations. The reality is that government, labor unions, corporations, military are an intertwined network of power already. And that what is really needed is not to empower one in the fiction that it will regulate the other and keep it tamed. The real need is for people to realize that these institutions are just legal constructs. They're just uh, uh, paper or digital uh, structures and that we need to bring ourselves into those organizations and organize, which means that the left and the right need to organize together. They need to unite together to say, well, yes, government has grown too big and too powerful. Corporations have grown too big and too powerful. Our objective is not to overthrow them because that would in fact lead to a worse outcome. Our objective is to restore uh, the human qualities that have been lost in those institutions. And that means we have to do what we fear most, which is for progressives, progressives need to work with conservatives and libertarians, directly merging their uh, comparative strengths and conservatives and libertarian folks need to work with progressives and liberals to bring them together. So that's, I think, the, the, the path that these amazing students at UC Berkeley and other, and other campuses have begun with the Bridge USA uh, organization and with many others, and I look forward to being supportive of that down the road. Hi, how are you guys holding up out there? Uh, um, I'm Claudia Van Vacano, and um, I'm gonna, I am the executive director of DLab and uh, Digital Humanities at Berkeley, but I wanna put that aside for a second um, and speak really simply and directly to you. Um, um, I was born in, in Bolivia, uh, in La Paz, Bolivia, and during my infancy, um, I lived under dictatorial rule uh, under two generals, Bancid and Garcia Mesa. My father, a journalist uh, and a political novelist, um, and my mother, a community activist and teacher, were targeted by the government. Um, and so therefore, um, free speech is something that is deeply and profoundly in, in something that I value. Um, we came to this country as political refugees in order to seek um, uh, a place where my father could speak um, openly and freely. Um, and um, so when I was seven years old, um, my father was taken by military um, and I didn't see him for nearly two years after he was taken um, uh, in front of me. So you can imagine that when I arrived on the Berkeley campus during so-called free speech week, um, to a highly militarized police force gathered from across the region, specifically UC Davis and, and, and other police forces that are known and documented to have used practices like pepper spray. Um, these are not peacekeeping um, folks that know how to mediate conflict. Um, I have to say that it really struck a deep fear in my heart. It triggered a lot of uh, memories for me um, and really um, reminded me of what my childhood was like. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think it's, it's uh, for me, really important to try to contextualize this conversation that thus far, in my opinion, has been 
uh, lacking um, a few sort of grounding uh, features. Um, first and foremost, uh, the distinction between free speech and hate speech. Um, and uh, what's violence in the context of all of this? How do we safeguard, Robert Reich, um, I think, uh, was right in that we need to protect free speech. Uh, but the fundamental issue here, in my opinion, is what role does the institution of militarized police play in, in protection of free speech? Um, so um, as I was saying, you know, my uh, seeing this militarized police on this campus um, triggered a deep fear in me. And those fears, uh, I believe, were confirmed when I was speaking uh, with Rachel uh, um, Roberson, um, who represents uh, both the POC caucus in labor uh, and also in, in the grad division, um, works with the African American community, um, told me about what happened on Wednesday, which is uh, Wednesday is known as uh, Black Wednesday because once the black population on this campus dropped below 1%, um, the African American community decided to show a presence and to say you're not alone if you're the only person in your grad program that's black, you're not alone if you're the only black person in, in a math class or in a computer science class. Um, there is a whole community here of support. And we know from research that there's issues of stereotype threat, there's issues of imposter syndrome, there's issues that play a fundamental cognitive role in our performance and our ability to perform in higher education and to speak our minds um, and, to, and, and to speak our truths. Um, this group was gathered and was targeted actually on Wednesday um, by hate groups that um, used racial slurs directly to their faces. Um, and what the police did was surround both groups and increasingly um, enclose them closer and closer together. Um, the fact that there was no fight that broke out and there was no physical violence that occurred, which I think was the objective, um, Again, I don't speak on behalf of the DLAB or DH, but myself um, as an alumni, as a concerned citizen, and as a community member, um, is really, you know, it was a provocation. Um, and I think that, um, I think it was highly problematic and irresponsible. Um, and and uh, in any regard. Um, so I wanna go back to this issue of um, hate speech and hate acts. Um, first and foremost, they're disproportionately targeted to certain groups. Um, so I'm gonna try to see here if I can show some of these slides. Um, so I'm gonna transition and sort of put aside that personal experience and personal viewpoint um, and talk now more concretely about defining some terms and try to be a little bit more systematic um, uh, we're all researchers here, um, and so we try to be systematic about the way that we define the terms of dialogue. Um, and so um, one of the things that, um, that I want to say is that um, there is a way to distinguish between um, hate speech and other forms of, of speech. Um, and I think this is really important at a time when we, we are protecting hate speech um, as free speech. Um, what we're doing at uh, the D-Lab is we're working on a research project that specifically focused on online um, hate um, and thinking about how online hate is emerging um, through discourse platforms. Um, and we're doing this through a partnership with the Anti-Defamation League which we're very uh, honored to have um, and very excited about because it's part of this larger vision of taking a research activist stance, um, which means you could be anywhere within that spectrum of 100% just research or truly from an activist perspective. Uh, but really it opens up this issue of, for us, data science or digital humanities um, for, for human rights. Um, so we went through this elaborate process of, of creating a research agenda, which is like a multi-year research agenda. Um, but uh, importantly, our goal, our multi-year goal, is to create predictive models that can be applied 
to different platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, um, that can be uh, tested on things like New York Times, uh, et cetera, and can be scalable to identify hate speech and the predominance of the hate speech on those platforms. The, the vision is that in time we'll be able to use this algorithm, um, which is another thematic which I think is very interesting because um, uh, just in a, as an aside, um, this uh, Robert Reich uh, mentioned the uh, algorithm, this notion of algorithm. Um, we recently had at the Digital Humanities uh, Summer Institute a lot of discussion about algorithms should not be mysterious. We can unpack them, we can understand them. We are the creators of the algorithms. So um, I just wanted to state that, that it's not this mysterious thing that is kind of has a life of its own, but rather we are the creators of those algorithms and it's our responsibility to, to expose them, make them transparent, and to really discuss them and engage with them. Um, so in this case, we're, you know, we're specifically using um, an algorithm, a, a series of machine learning um, algorithms to understand, um, to teach machines what we believe to be hate speech, and then to try to systematically identify hate speech. Um, so here's the summary slide of, um, of you know, some of the specifics of, of what we did. I'm not going to go into it in great length, um, um, but I did want to display it. Um, I think that. Uh, one of the things that I did want to say is that this research project is really exciting to me because we have created an infrastructure where there is a research team that is able to collaborate in a way that, uh, you know, we spoke about the responsibility of a public university, that we can make these um, products that we're creating available through Jupyter Notebooks and GitHub and make that transparent. Some companies are, you know, like Facebook, are doing a similar thing than that we are uh, setting out to do. However, these are behind these kind of curtains and are not as easily, um, as easy to investigate or to, to dissect. And so everything that we're doing, we're doing in a highly reproducible and transparent manner. And additionally, I'm excited about this research team. I think it's a model of way uh, to develop a research team because we have faculty support, we have postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduates from a wide diversity of perspectives and, and positionalities. Um, in fact, I think Chris Kay from Political Science, who's here in the background, um, has been given the responsibility of handing out our, our one pager of all the contributors, um, which I am uh, really proud of because it shows the, the wide diversity of different perspectives. Um, um, and contributions in the team. Um, so what I do want to get into with uh, a little bit more depth is just simply that what we needed to do was um, label about 9,000 online comments. Um, and frequently during this stage for machine learning, um, it, it's unclear who does the labeling of that data. Uh, we used a really rigorous, I think, um, qualitative um, method to label that data and to look at the intercoder reliability. Um, but importantly, one of the things that emerged from that was that depending on the positionality of the thematic coder, the person labeling these hate speech acts really impacted them and also the way that they were able to label hate speech, hate not hate. Um, the definition, importantly, of, um, of hate speech is really, um, it, to me, it's at the core of a lot of what we're talking about. Um, because hate speech is aimed to terrorize, express pre prejudice, um, and contempt, tort, um, and humiliate, degrade, abuse, threaten, ridicule, demean, and discriminate based on race, ethnicity, uh, gender, religion, um, sexual orientation, um, et cetera. And so I think that definition of hate speech, I think, should really ground our conversation. Um, and it's not surprising, then, that our uh, thematic coders and the qualitative aspect of our machine learning um, project uh, were really disproportionately you know, impacted and, and had to contextualize what they were reading in different ways than, than those that hadn't had those first-hand experiences. 
Um, so, um, in any regard, uh, the, the, I'm just going to get to the sort of uh, bottom line here is that amazingly, we were able, the machine learning uh, part of the research team was able to um, fairly accurately uh, predict um, hate, not hate uh, speech, which was the very first phase of our project, and we're going to be scaling up the project. Um, uh, in this year and next year. Um, and so um, with that, I think I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you all. That was uh, really wonderful. Um, I so much appreciate having these very different perspectives, positionalities, and um, sort of stages of academic journey on stage with us. I think it's really valuable to hear all of these different voices. Um, I'd like to ask just a couple of connecting questions to kind of draw together your different comments. And one of the things I was really taken with um, started with the idea of public or private that you that you first put out, um, Jeffrey, that in our current internet moment that those boundaries are blurred. Right? We don't have the same public-private divisions that maybe we once had. And thinking through that as we begin to think about the space of the university, particularly the public space of the university, the physical space, and we're going to have a panel later on that's going to deal with space more directly, but to address your, your comments, thinking, uh, Nicole, as you pointed out, this idea of the university as a laboratory, as a place of um, experiment um, and risk, and the public university in particular, in particular, is a place where um, these these experiments are being done on um, on a stage that is perhaps more open, um, and the risk that is involved in that. So I guess I'm just hoping that maybe um, to ground this conversation as we go forward, you might comment a little further about how you see this role of the sort of private experiment of the scholar as someone who is um, working out ideas and the risk that is involved in that, or as someone who feels you know, motivated to put that out there uh, with this, the importance of the sort of the public university and the, the boundaries between the online and the offline. So I don't really know that I have particularly a really rooted question, but if you can perhaps see where maybe you see your work touching upon some of these other ideas that have been presented. I'll we'll give it to you first and then anybody else too, perhaps. Okay, um, can you all hear me if I don't need the microphone? Okay. We're recording. Okay. Yeah. Is this on? Yes. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I understood your question. Yeah, I don't really know that I understand my question. I think I think I think I'm really curious how all of you are thinking about the the role of the public and the private within the university setting, mm -hmm. within the public the actual physical public space of the university, as well as the online space, and the, the type of discourse that you're you're talking about being sort of required of academic life. This type of rigorous. Um, thought and critique. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is how the idea of public is changing, the public university is changing with uh, neoliberal trends that are occurring. So the public university, like I said, its, it's original mission was supposed to increase accessibility, particularly for underrepresented groups. It's supposed to have this democratizing mission that helps prepare competent, compassionate uh, citizenry. Um, and when there's huge divestments in this public good and administrators have to spend an obscene amount of time, you know, schmoozing with corporate people, people who have a lot of money, um, that's going to, uh, the people with money are going to influence the agenda of the university. Um, and uh, it also is going to create more um, adjunct faculty who are more at risk of, you know, speaking out and perhaps losing their job security. 
um, and tenure positions are less. And then also a lot of tenure professors that I've spoken to want to become full professors or deans. And so they also uh, are concerned with what they say. And um, a lot of times people are hired here not because they have this deep commitment to the public, but because it's a job. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that, um, that are changing the, the essence of what a public good is supposed to be. I'll let other people respond as well. Uh, I think th those are very good points. I, I, I think the one point I was making uh, was that with the internet you see all of this behavior and, and attitudes that used to be transacted in, 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 in private, like those kids on a bus and it might find its way to YouTube, but most of which just was invisible. All of a sudden surfaces and bubbles up and becomes the source of this kind of congealed activity in the in port I mean in the, of, of, of the of the trolls and so on and so forth um, and that's that's a real problem uh, for for anybody at the university it's not the kind of speech that we're accustomed to addressing in the way we might address bad speech in the in the public forum that, that it, it's not part of rational inquiry the other part of that which I think you you stressed uh, is that the role of uh, the 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 uh, academic or the journalist or uh, any of the people who, who make it their business to participate in the activity of free public inquiry uh, and who traditionally have had public lives and private lives that, that are distinct from that. And, and, and one is in fact expected not to uh, acknowledge the private life of, 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 of someone with whom you're disputing about a question of economics or whatever. Um, their private lives are now accessible uh, to, to, to these trolls and so on and so forth, um, which, which is what makes it so chilling and terrifying. Uh, and, and it's part of uh, this larger effort to undermine this, this assault on the university, on the media, on other traditional liberal institutions uh, uh, that, that we're, 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 we're trying to live with now, and that the object of which is really to just bring down free inquiry. Um, so I, I think it's a very, the, the points you make in, in particular are, 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 are dramatic examples of, 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 of the problem that we, we're dealing with. I also wanted to add um, the context of what uh, UC Berkeley, right, historically has been a platform or a battleground. Um, and depending on who is governor and who is president of the United States, right? And so if you do a historical analysis of how UC Berkeley, uh, what kind of role UC Berkeley has played, um, I think that's a really important thing to note. Um, when we, um, as we engage in our um, research, uh, one of the things that we uh, did was to look at within the literature to see that actually hate speech acts um, increased um, during um, Trump's administration when he did, when you know certain times that he spoke about um, you know uh, Mexicans when he you know when he modeled basically uh, not very uh, collegial ways of talking or, or very warm ways of talking about different groups. Um, we saw in the in the research we see that there's a spike in hate uh, speech acts online. Um, um, so that's that's something else that that I wanted to uh, bring up. And um, I think that this point is well taken about um, you know whether this is about money or not money because um, the networks. So the, another thing in the literature review that we found was that uh, through online. Uh, network analysis, you see that the, there's a, a coalition of hate groups that is growing and strengthening. So there's a lot of different organizational structures that are at play uh, within this larger institution of the university. Um, um, some of them are tied to economic or, or sort of formal economic or governmental, um, but some are very new, um, having to do with these uh, this ability to mobilize networks of people um, that are associated with hate speech or hate acts. Um, 
And one thing that I wanted to add specifically about, and I can't speak too much to the public-private distinction, but this idea that I think that free speech has been, and what I mentioned before, is that free speech has been highly politicized, and that politicization of the term and the usage of free speech, and then categorizing, you know, saying that this is hate speech, this is free speech, has really galvanized this um, idea of doxing and this idea of uh, targeting specific pieces. Uh, types of people and you know and professor Reich alluded to this about big money and i think that that is one cause of this politicization but i think that one of the larger causes is this just this gradual trend in american politics of two different camps of people just separating and then losing hope in this idea of coming together and discussing and having productive dialogue and i think that you know there needs to be a reinvigoration of this idea that free speech is not and i and i mentioned this before and bridge tries to emphasize this a lot in a lot of our events is this idea that free speech is not just an end in of itself and we must utilize free speech in a responsible manner to further constructive discourse it is absolutely um there free if if we use free speech and we use it to merely just spout our own rhetoric and i'm not particularly saying it happens on one side i think it happens on all sides of the political spectrum I think that's very important to note because some of our conservative friends and then some of our liberal friends, the reason why they don't take so kindly to these comments is because we immediately associate that these comments are specifically targeted to one side. And I think that that needs to be highlighted, that everything that we're saying here is a function of different groups and not just one specific group. And I think that th that's very important. So I would just close with this idea that we must reinvigorate hope within young people and within people of you know different individuals who use social media to really see free speech as means of achieving a further goal and not as just an end of itself. I, um, I teach a course here called uh, uh, Power and Purpose, and the reason I do it is because I, I see much, so much potential in young people who are still driven by purpose and have not gotten into the world where they've learned the algorithms of power and, and are just uh, sinking into using those, but actually bring their, bring their, bring their power uh, 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 bring their power in advance of their uh, of their purpose. I think underlying the the problem uh, here is that it is so easy to manipulate the algorithm to the benefit of a particular cause. When I was leading an environmental group uh, uh, years ago, uh, we found through testing direct mail fundraising that uh, uh, fundraising that demonized an enemy and said that enemy was about to pounce uh, outperformed email that was inspiring and uh, and and talked of positives by about two and a half to one which means that we made money when we reached out and demonized our corporate opponents and we lost money when we reached out and inspired people to join together that was a function of the market. That was a function of the, the algorithm at that time. Now we have that even more so. So that unfortunately, free speech uh, in a system where we learn how to manipulate the algorithm, that is, how do we attract more eyeballs to our cause, motivates people who are purpose-based at first to become cynical and to use the power to, 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 to become hateful. On this campus, on many campuses, students who are right of center feel oppressed when they come to campus. They feel that they're in an, in an environment where they can't express their ideas because left of center perspectives are much more validated than right of center perspectives. Some of them get pissed off about that. Some of them feel a sense of uh, that they're being persecuted. And they become angry. And they say, well, what are we going to do? And then they bring on people like Milo and Ann Coulter, who are media creations that, uh, that attract a lot of eyeballs and sell a lot of ads. And they bring them on. And they say, well, I'm going to stick it to you because you're not letting me speak. So I'm going to have the most offensive possible people come and speak to you. And that discredits the whole idea of free speech. I fully stand behind their right to bring those folks to campus, and I think those people should be allowed and ignored as much as possible to express. But I think it's very destructive to, to make that connection. So my call is for people to become aware of that algorithm, if you will, aware that it's not the conservatives that are fundamentally racist, sexist, and need to be oppressed. And it's not the progressives that are fundamentally, uh, 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 you know, against prosperity and against freedom. 
it really is two communities that have deep purposes that they're both trying to advance, and those communities need to work together. It's difficult and complicated, but they need to work together so that we can have freedom and justice, prosperity, and the environment, and all of the things that go together to make a good life. I think I've got a mic, but um, I think we'll open up to questions to the audience, and while we do that, um, yeah, I mean, maybe I will also point out that I think to Claudio's, Claudia's observations, I think there is something that we should be aware of in the fact that there is the role of student, the role of faculty member, the role of um, community on campus that has been very much altered by the fact that Berkeley is on this very wide national and international stage right now, and, and has been in the past, but more so now more than ever, and that the physical um, alterations to our campus, the, the barricades, the police presence, uh, do change that and, and create an additional sort of surveillance system that, along with both the social media aspect, um, alters this sort of private public dichotomy that we were talking about, but also um, just sort of a wider scope of ways with which we can um, grow and learn as academics and as, as learning bodies. Um, I don't know, do we have any questions from the audience right now? Yeah, great. Hello, okay. Um, so I have a, a couple questions, but I want to premise it on a couple things. Um, I think that we're really misunderstanding the nature of the argument here, because I don't think it's about free speech. Um, I, and maybe I should just say, I've, I've been at every single one of these events. Um, the only one I missed was Milo's first infamous visit, and I've been at every one of these since then. And I think that the whole uh, concept of free speech is a canard, and it's a lie. Um, and, and I think that's proven out by the fact that Milo set up a weak of free speech and was on sprawl for 20 minutes. He had no statement pre-planned or ready to go to express his free speech with, right? What the purpose of all that was and what no, people aren't talking about as much is not what Milo said or even what Ben Shapiro said or even that they were on the campus. It's the mass of minions that descend on the towns where they come and speak and terrorize the communities. Milo isn't the one that went 50 deep to Revolution Books for four days straight and terrorized them and antagonized them and physically forced their way into that business. Milo wasn't there. He said a prayer for 20 minutes on Sproul Hall and went home. And I would assert that him and the Mercers and the Cokes see this as a massive success while the media talks about Milo's failed free speech week. And so again, I want to come back to free speech. I think that um, Mario Savio established, we, we, we established what free speech is. And as much as I hate the things that they're saying, I will support their right to say the foulest things. And trust me, they do. I mean, I don't even know if I should repeat a tenth of the things that they said to us for a week straight. This is the foulest, vilest things. But that's okay. I'm okay with them saying that. It's what they did otherwise. They used free speech to attack this community. Berkeley University is now in total, how do we deal with this mode? That was a success for the Mercers and for the Cokes and for the people who fund Milo and, and Ben Shapiro. This, this campus is less focused on educating our youth and, and dialogue that furthers the communal discourse forward. Instead, we're talking about what is free speech. Mario Savio established that in 1964, and lastly, I'll say this because you're moving towards the mic, <laughs> to what they feel about free speech and, and the fact that they sold their free speech week on the legacy of Mario Savio. I stood on the steps of Sproul Hall on Wednesday. And I spoke Mario Savio's words that he had spoken from the steps of Sproul Hall, and they shouted me down and stuck flags in my face. And they also said, see, taste of your own medicine, because yes, I have been shouting them down and throwing signs in their faces when they came to speak, but the difference is I'm not selling it on I'm, my, my right to free speech. 
That's the cornerstone of their thing is free speech, and the first time someone who disagreed with them expressed it, they shot it down. It's not about free speech. This is about attacking progress. And it's, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll. Uh, no, I appreciate your comments, and I think one of the things that the ethos with which you spoke, I think, speaks to the national frustration around this issue, and I appreciate uh, what you had to say. Uh, and I, this is one of the things that I brought up, that free speech is politicized, and basically that's the nerdy way to say uh, that free speech is being used by different people. But with all due respect, I think that there is one point of disagreement that I have with you, and that is this idea that um, free speech is a non-issue. And I think that we in Berkeley are in a, in a bubble of um, our own ideologies, and I think that there's a lack of acknowledgement of uh, ideologies that fall on different parts of the political spectrum. And I think that you brought up the point that the purpose of the university is to educate. And I would argue, and I think Professor Reich and uh, Carol also argued this and made this point, that the key component of education is making sure that universities are a melting pot for different ideas and making sure that universities are uh, inculcating hope within our youth to utilize things like democratic deliberation, which is another way to say free speech, as a means to achieve change. And I think that the, the last point I want to make is that we cannot lose hope in this idea of dialogue with the other side as a mechanism for change. And, you know, I, 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 I completely understand your frustration, but we must do everything in our power to confront those ideologies, because if we think that those ideologies are poor, if we think that those ideas are bad, then the only way we defeat those ideas are with better ideas, right? And that is what we must inculcate this idea of. And that's why I think that people like Milo, the reason why they have so much time right now in air is because they're the ones that are controlling this narrative. The minorities are. And I think, and I hate to use this term silent majority because this was politicized in the last election. But 90% of Americans want this idea of discussion, right? So what Bridge is trying to do and what we're all essentially, I think, agree on this point is that we must galvanize this idea of productive dialogue and make it centerpiece. So I think that's an underlying solution to the problem that you pointed to. Uh, not only do we need to galvanize it, but we need to perform it that's great. Um, uh, here with each other today. Um, uh, I thank this panel uh, very much for their time and thoughts. We didn't even get to the beginning of the end of, um, uh, of what you're talking about, but I look forward to continuing the discussion over the, over the rest of the day. So let's give everyone a, a round of applause for our, our first panel. Um,